Tonight, the new series True Life Crime investigates the most harrowing mysteries, rocking headlines and social feeds. Young lives gone too soon. Their deaths were shocking and haunting questions remain. I'm True Life Crime UK correspondent Linda Ade, and I'm here to join the dots and expose the truth. A sixth form student murdered in her own home. We couldn't understand why someone would want to break into her house and especially kill her in the process. A town in shock and a family in grief. You can never imagine your world would turn upside down and be destroyed in a day. And that's basically what's happened. How a killer tried to send detectives up a blind alley. Ellie's body had been arranged so that her hand was on a knife. And why her savage death serves as a warning and a catalyst for change. We've been pressurising the government ministers to look again at how sentences are given out. It's an issue that affects all young women. It's not just here in the UK, it's absolutely everywhere across the world. I'm heading to Carn in Wiltshire, gateway to England's West Country. But in 2019, Carn was also the scene of a horrific crime that caught the whole of Britain's attention. And at its centre is a 17-year-old girl, Ellie Gould. Her sudden death on the 3rd of May shattered the tight-knit community. I was so shocked that she had died. I was almost going through it in my brain, like, what could have happened? When I found out that it was Ellie, I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> I still can't believe it's happened. I don't think it ever will. Ellie was found on her kitchen floor with a knife in her neck, just days before she was due to take her A-level mock exams. It's hard to imagine the shock that Ellie's family must have felt that day. They had raised a clever and ambitious young woman. And now, in an instant, it was all gone. I need to know what happened. So I want to find out more about Ellie from her mum, Carol. Carol, thank you for meeting me today. I really want to know a bit more about Ellie. What was she like as a child? Very happy, always giggling. She had a passion for animals. That was her thing, yeah. Very, very gentle girl. She had guinea pigs that she oh. looked after so carefully. So, Pickles, what do you think about Jem zapping Joe? <laughs> and then she moved on to horses. She um, had horses? Mm. A lot of happy memories of those times when we used to ride out in the Wiltshire countryside and Aww. her saying, it's all right, Mum, we won't go fast. And I'd be going, oh, please slow down. Don't I want to go fast? <laughs> what was the last moment that you had to Philly? It was on the morning. Um, and we had a conversation about after school, we were planning to go up to the stables and she was going to do some jumping in the school. That's what she said she wanted to do. So can you tell me how you found out that she had died? My husband, he just rang me hysterical and said, Carrie, you've got to come home, Ellie's had an accident. But I just dropped everything. I, I just kept thinking, what's she done? What's she done? But also I kept thinking, but she shouldn't be home. She should have been at school. So when you arrive? I remember seeing an ambulance on the drive, and then I saw Matt just sobbing, and as I ran towards Matt, a policeman stopped me and asked me who I was. And um, I said, I'm Ellie's mother, what's happened, what's happened? And then I looked at Matt and he just said, she's died. And you just... Had you, know, you seen her at that point? I, I wasn't allowed in the house. Matt and I were having a discussion in the back of the car about what it could potentially have been. Do you think she put a knife in the toaster and then electrocuted herself, fell backwards, hit her head, something like that? And he just couldn't speak. And then he suddenly said to me, there was too much blood, Carol, there was too much blood. Oh, God. And I looked at him and thought, what can that mean, too much blood? Just, I can't imagine. No. 
he's never talked, he's never been able to talk about. You can never imagine your world will turn upside down and be destroyed in a day, and that's basically what's happened. Ellie's body was found at 3 p.m. Police took control of the scene. It would be hours before more details around Ellie's death were revealed to her heartbroken family. I can understand why an accident was the first thing that crossed the family's mind. Ellie was popular and seemed to be loved by everyone. The idea that someone else may have harmed her must have just been too much to take in. And not only for her mum and dad, but her friends too. She was a very contagious person. Like, you couldn't not find her funny. Like, she would sort of light up a room. Everyone always mentions about how if they were walking in the crowd and if she didn't even know them, she would just give them a smile and it would really make their day. She was just really, really approachable. You know, if you were having a rough day, you could always go and talk to Ellie and she'd make you feel, she'd make you smile, she'd make you laugh, all of that, you know. Ellie was part of a tight social circle, all sharing the same interests and hopes for the future. I've arranged to speak to Harriet, one of those who was closest to her. Thank you so much for meeting me today. Yeah, no problem. How did you become friends with Ellie? We'd just been in the same lessons and kind of knew each other, we spoke, but it was the first day of sixth form that I approached her. Ellie was the glue within the group. She, she invited a lot of people in to be friends with us, so it was just like this one big happy family. When did you hear something had happened to Ellie? We found an article that said that a 17-year-old girl was found dead oh in her God. home. And then we realised it was Ellie's road. And so Carol... you found out online in the article? We found out online, yeah. What was going on in your mind? It was just complete confusion. I, I couldn't comprehend any of it. Initially, we thought that someone had tried to break in and you thought had it was a break -in. killed her in the process, yeah. Did Ellie have any enemies? She had no enemies or anybody that we should have been concerned about. That's what was so hard, trying to piece things together, is we couldn't make sense of anything. It's interesting that Harriet raised the idea of a break-in. As a city girl, I'm used to hearing about burglaries and violence, but I don't tend to associate areas like this with those sort of crimes. Still, burglaries do happen here and there's always a possibility of intruders being disturbed. But I would think a 17-year-old girl would more likely run away if there was a break-in. It just doesn't add up. Judging by the way the investigation went, the police were also quick to discount that this was a break-in gone wrong. In fact, they appeared convinced that whoever had stabbed Ellie wasn't a stranger at all, but someone she knew. To find out who that was, Detectives began talking to her friends. That included her classmate, Ellie Wellin, who often gave her lifts to and from school. Well, thank you so much for meeting me. How did you hear that something could happen to Ellie Gould? I'd got a call from my dad or mama to say, like, can you come home? There's police at the house. Why were the police at your house? I think my name had been mentioned because I, I was supposed to be picking Ellie up that day to go to school. OK, so when you got home, yeah. what, what happened next? I was sort of questioned, I was asked, you know, how, had I seen Ellie that day? Did I know where she was? And I said that I was supposed to be picking her up, but she had told me that she didn't really fancy going to school that day. That's really strange. It was particularly odd because she had sort of promised me that she was going to come in because we both didn't like history. And I was, initially I kind of thought, oh, she's gone for a walk and her mum's gone home and like hasn't found her at home sort of thing and has just, you know, called the police out of your, like, panic yeah. of, like, where's my daughter? And then they told me that she had died. I can't... I, I know I burst into tears. What were the police asking you about? Um, so the police were asking me, you know, had I seen Ellie that day? OK. Um, where had I been that day? Did you know anything um, at that time? At the time, I, I hadn't suspected anything. There was a few odd things that had happened during the day, but I wouldn't have put two and two together and I, I wouldn't have even mentioned it as something that would have been odd. And they were very interested in one person in particular. But who was this person the police were interested in? And what was their connection to Ellie? A neighbour of the Goulds had seen a young man in a black hoodie arriving at Ellie's house. Well, that's huge.
I'm looking into the sudden and violent death of sixth form student Ellie Gould, whose body was discovered at her family home in Carn, Wiltshire, in May 2019. At first, her family and friends suspected an accident, but with multiple knife wounds to her neck, detectives soon concluded otherwise. Karen Bell was a reporter who covered the case from the beginning. Can you talk me through the police investigation? How much did they know in the first few hours? I think it was very clear to the police very quickly what had happened. Uh, they could see that this was a murder, not an accident, not a suicide. Straight away? Straight away. A neighbour of the Goulds had seen a young man in a black hoodie arriving at Ellie's house. Well, that's huge. Yeah. Ellie's body had been arranged so that her hand was, was on, on a knife. knife. It was a horrible amateurish attempt to make it look like a suicide, I presume. That is just yeah. horrific. Yeah. So this is how they found their person of interest? The police then say one of the first questions they ask Ellie's parents is, does she have a boyfriend? Whenever there's a domestic homicide of a young woman in particular, a police investigation team will always think about partners or ex-partners. Yes. Yeah. Whoever knocked on Ellie's door shortly before she died had to be the prime suspect, and apparently he knew it, which is why he took steps to hide his face so none of the neighbours would recognise him afterwards. Is there any chance a boyfriend could be involved in this innocent 17-year-old's death? I want to investigate Ellie's love life around the time of her killing. I'm meeting another of Ellie's closest school friends, Tilda, to find out more. Hey, Tilda. I know that you are, you were one of Ellie's closest friends. What was your friendship circle like then at that point? We were just all friends, really. When Tom got with Ellie, that was the only relationship that was going on. And what was that like? He was quite reserved, but once you did engage in conversation with him, he was, he was a nice boy. Can you tell me a bit about their relationship then? What did you make of it as they got quite serious? This was her first really ever proper relationship. You know, he made her smile, he made her laugh. Did anything change in their relationship at all? So when it sort of came to about two months in, he was a lot more in the relationship than she was. He was sort of starting to talk about marriage and kids and she was like, well, this he is just about marriage. Yeah, she was just a bit taken aback by that. That was sort of a red flag for her, I think. It sounds like Ellie had a strong relationship with her boyfriend, but maybe she felt it was moving too fast. Tom Beach knew Ellie from the time they started secondary school. He's never spoken publicly about her death before, but has agreed to speak to me. Well, um, thank you for meeting me today, Tom. How would you describe your friendship with Ellie? Basically, we talked a lot. You know, every lunchtime, break time at school we'd go through, we'd always meet. She was just really easy to talk to. I think that's why we kind of grew together. Did you ever meet her boyfriend? I did meet him. Did Ellie tell you about her relationship? I remember her saying a couple of times that he was kind of protective of her. He's protective? Yeah, protective in, just in the way that she wanted to go out. I, actually, I do remember one example. She wanted to go out one evening to a party, I think, and I knew that there were going to be some other boys at the party, and I know he wasn't very happy about it at all, that she wanted to go. I, to be honest, I've always thought there was something a bit off about Tom. I, it didn't feel right the way he was, certainly not, not to, not to me. Do you remember anything significant leading up to Ellie's death, like the days leading up to her death? Did anything happen? I certainly remember her saying that her and Tom were going to take a break. So I think she just kind of said to him, actually, I need to get on with my A-levels. Can we just have a break for now? This is quite huge information. I think I need to investigate that a bit yeah. further. Detectives confirm Ellie had broken up with Tom on Thursday, the night before she's found dead. They question Tom immediately and find him suspicious. His story is inconsistent. When he matched the description of the hooded figure outside Ellie's house, the police believe they have their man. The arrest of Thomas Griffiths took place a matter of hours after Ellie's body was found, but it was a gamble. By that stage, there was no forensic evidence linking him to the crime, and he himself was denying any involvement. 
For Ellie's friends already reading from the news of her death, the arrest was yet another shock. I looked on Instagram and I looked at the DMs and someone had sent, has anybody heard from Tom? There's police cars outside his house. And I just remember thinking, what? Like, how? Why? Like, who would murder such an innocent, amazing girl? I just thought they've got the wrong person. He would never do anything like that. We thought we knew him and we thought that he wasn't capable of doing something like this. But others who'd known Griffiths for longer speak of a more complex character who showed a side few others had seen. I've come to meet Hugo. He was good friends with Ellie and Tom and became close to Tom after they began playing rugby together. Hugo, thank you so much for meeting me today. How would you describe Tom? I knew Tom sort of from about age of five. So I went to primary school with Tom. Everyone sort of wanted to be mates with Tom. What was your friendship like? In primary school, we didn't really get on. Uh, there was sort of a lot of uh, bullying that went on. So Tom was quite a manipulative character in primary school. There's a story that my mum tells me and Tom used to just sort of grab rocks and encourage other people to like throw them out onto the road. Oh my God. Um, and then he'd sort of stand back after a while and watch us all throwing the rocks and wait until sort of a teacher come over and get sort of a bit of enjoyment out of sort of tell it, us getting a bit of a telling off from it. That's um, really manipulative. So yeah. It's so from, such a young age as well to yeah. think like that. Yeah, definitely. So how did things change for you? Did you start to like him? It was good in secondary school. I felt like we could talk to each other about sort of anything, which was quite good to sort of have as lads. And then uh, it was definitely good. He sort of got me into rugby. Was there anything about him on the pitch? Did you see a different side of him? I mean, sometimes he could have got quite aggressive towards players, but then again, it's sort of uh, a not, I feel like that's quite a normal thing for rugby players to do, is sort of switch up and have sort of their own little mindset. Um, he got quite aggressive. Yeah, so he could have, I feel like sometimes everyone gets a little bit wound up and aggressive, but he was definitely very short-tempered, to say the least. We now know that Griffiths could be bullying and aggressive. He had a short temper, and Elliot just ended their relationship. That's a worrying cocktail, but not enough to prove guilt. But this was a fast-moving case, and more evidence was building up. The shocking truth of what happened to Ellie Gould that day would soon emerge. So they search in a nine minute radius, find a bag of blood stained clothes on a footpath through Woodland. I'm investigating the shocking death of Ellie Gould that took place on the 3rd of May 2019. At 3 p.m., 17-year-old Ellie Gould is found stabbed to death on her kitchen floor. By 6 p.m., detectives have arrested her former boyfriend, Tom Griffiths, on suspicion of murder. At this point, Griffiths is denying any involvement, but as journalist Karen Bell explains, CCTV proves to be a game changer. Can you talk me through what this footage is? Well, the police know that Griffiths told teachers that morning at school he was going home because he wasn't feeling well. OK. And they very quickly discover this CCTV, and it shows him getting onto the bus at Chippenham bus station, catching a bus home to Derry Hill. Right. Mobile phone evidence shows his movement, shows he went to Ellie's house. After this? After this. Mobile phone evidence shows he comes back to his home but then disappears for 18 minutes. Right. So they search in a nine minute radius around his house, find a bag of blood stained clothes on a footpath through Woodland. With whose blood on it? Ellie's. With Ellie's blood. Now couple that with the fact he's got scratches on his neck and that he has a motive. He was dumped by Ellie on the Thursday and they charge him. For those still reeling from the shock of Ellie's death, the news was hard to take. It was one of those moments where you just crumpled and think, how could he? We welcomed him into our home, and just because she finished with him, he took her life. You get some sense of clarity almost because you know that someone has been charged with it. Obviously, it was confusing because it was our friend. There was no time that I can think of 
was an indication that he was capable of doing something like this. Despite initially denying any involvement, at the end of August 2019, Griffith pleads guilty to Ellie's murder. The public was about to hear the full shocking details of the attack and of his efforts to hide his involvement. I'm going back to meet Ellie's mum again. I couldn't believe when I heard that Griffiths had something to do with this after all. Over a three month relationship That's nothing. at the age of 17, it just makes no sense. And also that there were no red flags, there were no warning signs that he was such a monster. He changed his black sweatshirt that he was wearing and he changed his white trainers. The weather hadn't changed. There would be no reason to put a black hoodie top on other than to hide your identity. That's what it sounds like, yeah. Absolutely. He strangled Ellie first. His hands were the weapon. And then when she fell to the ground unconscious, he could have stopped at that point. Yeah. But instead, he reached for a knife and stabbed her 13 times in the neck. The murder was frenzied, but Griffiths' behaviour immediately after was cool and manipulative. I think it was sort of just after Tom had killed Ellie that he felt he needed to cover his tracks. And so he sort of sent messages into group chats. He said that he was having a really hard time. And he also asked if anyone had seen Ellie and because he needed to talk to her. One of the pictures had it was from his neck up and you could see the scratches all over his neck. The marks on Tom's neck that were supposedly self-harm were from Ellie trying to escape Tom from strangling her. When the time came for sentencing, Griffiths' lawyer read out a letter on his behalf. Did he apologise? He said, I'm sorry for the pain that it's caused. I hope one day I can explain myself. That, to me, is not holding your hands up and saying, I am so sorry for what I did, and just saying that I don't know what I did, until she was dead on the kitchen floor. Jeez. But he came around very quickly, didn't he, when he had to cover up his tracks. He washed the knife to get his DNA off it, and then he put Ellie's hand on the knife and reinserted it into her he neck. Oh, my God. Then he washed his shoes in the sink, I can't believe the extent that he went to cover up what he had done. The depraved lengths Griffiths would go to would make a lasting impact. Ellie Wellin had received a text from Ellie Gould not to pick her up that morning on their usual route into school. One of the messages that Ellie had sent to me was probably not from Ellie. Timings-wise, she wouldn't have been alive. He used Ellie's fingerprint to get onto her phone to stop me from coming. If I had went, what could I have done? Whether, um, sorry. <laughs> whether I could have stopped it from happening or whether I would have just gone in and seen Ellie on the floor or, or it, it, it's, um, sorry. For killing Ellie in her own home, Griffiths was sentenced to a minimum of just 12 and a half years. That means he could be free before his 30th birthday. Angry at the ruling, Carol spoke out, furious with a sentence she felt didn't reflect the crime. Carol's very public stance struck a chord with another mother. Julie Davies' daughter, Poppy, was also brutally murdered by her former boyfriend. She had already begun to research the woeful sentencing of domestic homicide cases and started demanding change from politicians and experts. Julie has agreed to talk with me about Poppy and her friendship with Carol. Julie, thank you so much for meeting me today. When did you hear about Ellie and Carol? I saw it on the news um, and realised that the situations were so similar. I thought there's, you know, there's a mother I need to be getting in touch with. Please, could you tell me a little bit about Poppy? Poppy was very loyal, very focused sort of individual, great work ethic. Yeah, good fun to be with. What was she doing at uni? She was doing uh, financial maths. She started all a, a year early. She was moved up at, at school. She's very academic. It was while studying at Nottingham that she met fellow student Joe Atkinson. They later moved into a flat in Leeds 
and Poppy worked as a quantitative trading analyst. But by late 2018, Poppy wanted to end the relationship. Did she tell you that she was planning on breaking up with, with Joe? Yeah, so she told me mid-October that um, she was breaking up with him. Right. So she had arranged to move out then. Two days after she was murdered, she, she was leaving. What happened to Poppy the night that she died? On the Friday morning, 14th of December, he went into the kitchen, he chose his weapon, oh, he chose God. the kitchen knife. She was in bed and she managed somehow, goodness knows how, to get away from him to get to the door of the flat. And then there's forensic evidence which shows that he must have pulled her onto the floor and turned her over and sat on her and then oh, continued yeah. um, stabbing her until, in his words, she stopped moving. And that was 23 stab wounds. There were 49 knife wounds oh, overall, God. and then over 100 injuries on the body. And then he attempted to clean bits of the flat, took the knife and his bag of clothes and drove off an hour away to dispose of the clothes. Try to hide clothes. it. Yeah. And, you know, all the time, Poppy is right by the door of the flat. He's stepping over her. What sort of sentence did he get, Julie? So, because the weapon was deemed to be at the scene of the crime... Yeah. ..the guidance is the minimum starting tariff is 15 years. So his ended up going to 16 years, two months. He got 16 years? 16 years, two months, yeah, yeah. If... 16 years? If it had been outside, he'd taken a weapon, then the starting point would have been 25 years. Two cases of violent murder of young women, two very low minimum terms. What sort of message does that send? Especially at a time when violence against women and cases of femicide, where women are killed by men, are rife. There's a belief that women are killed in the streets. The reality is that is really quite rare. Every three days in the UK, a woman is killed by a man, and three quarters of those take place in the home. Carol and Julie are angry at a justice system they believe is skewed against women, and they want change. There are two factors that led to the low minimum terms of their daughter's killers. Firstly, Griffith's age. As he was under 18, the starting tariff was 12 years. Secondly, when both Griffiths and Atkinson arrived, they weren't carrying a weapon. The law suggests this can't be described as premeditated. I need more information on domestic homicide, so I'm meeting a leading expert on the subject, criminologist Jane Monkton-Smith. Um, Jane, thank you so much for meeting me today. So I understand that you're quite familiar with the cases of Ellie and Poppy. What type of crime was committed? Well, this is what I would call an intimate partner homicide. That's when, usually, a man kills his wife or girlfriend as a result of them separating. Do these type of murders happen often? These homicides are not rare. Really? They are the second biggest category of homicide that we have. For women, being killed by your partner is the biggest. Wow, I, I had no idea. People don't recognise or realise the scale of the problem. I mean, it's not just here in the UK, mm. it's absolutely everywhere across the world. For Jane, the punishments for Ellie and Poppy's killers were no surprise. According to her research, those guilty of domestic homicides often receive lower sentences. That's quite disturbing to hear. And I really don't know why we consider that those homicides are less dangerous or, you know, that there's no wider threat to the community. Mm. We tend to think that they were spontaneous, but the research tells us otherwise. And in most cases, probably over 90%, there is some level of planning. It's been thought through? Yes. We've got to get away from the spontaneous crime of passion explanation. 
that, that word passion really dilutes how serious the crime is. It mixes it up with high emotion, but there's the other meaning of passion, you know, an intimate or sexual passion, maybe. You put those two things together and you've got all of the excuses that you need for this person. Exactly. Yeah. Making excuses for men to be violent. That, that, uh, that really resonates with me. That, scary. It is, you know, and if we, if we continue to make excuses for their, for their violence, they feel justified using the violence. I got emotional because I think up until that moment, talking to Jane, I didn't realise that the biggest risk to our safety as women is being killed by someone that you've loved. That's so scary to think about. Like Ellie and Poppy could have been anyone, it could have been me. It feels like we all need to be rallying behind Julie and Carol and fighting for the same changes. But how much are those in power really listening? We've been pressurising the government ministers to look again at how sentences are given out. I've been investigating the murder of Ellie Gould and what I've discovered has upset and shocked me. Femicide cases where women are killed by men are all too common here in Britain and throughout the world. Poppy Davy Waterhouse was also murdered by an ex-boyfriend following a breakup. Now their mothers have joined forces campaigning to change laws and achieve justice for victims. Carol and Julie hope to change sentencing laws for murder in two ways. First, the age of the offender, and second, the weapon present in the home. Their message has begun to spread far and wide. Nice to see you both again. How far has your campaign taken you? We've got as far as we have another meeting with Robert Buckland, the Lord okay. Chancellor. Do you feel quite positive that change will come after this meeting? He said that he is going to change things. I don't know quite what that's going to mean. Um, he is talking to a variety of people. My fear is that he won't make the giant leap from 15 to 25 years. If he's going to make any legislative changes, they may come in on the victim's bill. Fortunately, they won't make the police crime and sentencing bill, which will conclude at the end of this year. What does a new police crime and sentencing bill involve? Well, there's only a small part that really applies to us, and that is the sliding scale when it comes to youth sentencing for murder. Under the new proposed tariff, Thomas Griffith's minimum term, which currently starts at 12 years for all under 18s, would start at 14 years, just a two-year increase. Those who commit similar crimes, where the weapon has not been brought to the scene and are younger, would actually see their minimum terms decrease. To me, that just goes to show that they don't really take domestic homicides seriously and violence against women and girls seriously, because if they did, they wouldn't be lowering the sentencing. Jeez. What happens to sentencing when a murder weapon is already present remains to be seen. One politician who has given Carol and Julie her support is Jess Phillips. Keely McGrath, Poppy Davy Waterhouse, Lana Owen, the Labour MP has campaigned on domestic homicide and reads a list of more than 100 femicide victims every year, including Carol and Julie's own daughters. Emma Folds, Lauren Griffiths, Ellie Gould. Today, I've come to her constituency in Birmingham. Hey Jess, thank you for making time for me. Carol and Julie have told me that you've been helping them out quite a bit with their campaign. Can you tell me what that's involved and how it's how it's gone. We've been pressurising the government ministers to look again at how sentences mm. are given out and why in our country there is a essentially a disparity between stranger murder 
or murder out in the public realm and when people are murdered in their own homes. Why is it so important to get the sentencing right? First and foremost, that is what our British justice system should be. But also, there is a fundamental public interest here because I have handled cases where the perpetrator might be young. People are coming out of prison within six years, sometimes less even. I'm afraid to say that there are people behind bars in our country who have killed more than one woman, have come out of prison and re-offended. That was really hard to hear. You know, you spoke about the system not mm -hmm. taking violence against women seriously. Yeah. Does society see it like that too? Soci Do we take it seriously? I have society? to say, society has moved much, much faster than the system. So at the moment, there is not necessarily a minimum sentence that can be handed out. I would say in the trajectory, in the, in the same decade, of the way that the public feel about violence against women and girls has massively improved. Is the current system outdated? I mean, without question, the current system is a system that was designed by men, for men, mm. is administered largely by men. That's crazy when you put it like that. Mm -hmm. It really is. Carol and Julie are determined to make a difference, and they're not alone in seeking change. After Ellie's death, her friends launched a petition online to start self-defence classes in schools it gained over 18,000 signatures. It was raised in Parliament, but the idea was rejected. I'm back in Wiltshire to see Ellie's friends again to speak to them about their campaign. Scene six, take two, action. All right, I'm off, see you soon. Hey, handsome. What are you doing here? What are you at my house for? Just be more careful, yeah? Hi, Harriet. Hi, Ellie. Hi, How are you doing today? Good, thank good, you. Thanks, yeah. yeah. This looks really interesting. What's going on here? So after Ellie died, we started our petition to get self-defence within the curriculum as a mandatory subject. However, we sort of had to take a step back and think, OK, they're not going to help. We need to do this ourselves. Wow. We are filming our educational short film for our community interest company, Access Safety CIC. So we are trying to portray unhealthy and healthy relationships young people may encounter. Who is the film aimed at? Who will see it? The schools around Wiltshire. And then we aim to obviously get further across the nation with our film. We are also creating pamphlets, worksheets, leaflets for teachers as we have found that they feel unequipped. Why do you think this is important to do then? For me personally, I feel that the education system that we have at the moment regarding like relationships and education is just not quite adequate enough. I think the work that you are describing sounds absolutely incredible. Not only have you lost your friend, but you found the strength to like fight for change so that it doesn't happen to anyone else. I think that's so remarkable. Thank, Thank you. you. And just massive respects to you both for that. It's great to see Ellie's friends turning what was such a personal loss into a way to empower a whole community. For them to be so motivated, even though their own authorities offered so little help, is incredibly inspiring. But more widespread change will only come about with the support of the powerful. I requested an interview with the Justice Secretary and was told that that would not be possible due to changes in the law that might happen by the time this programme broadcasts. They provided us with this statement. Poppy Devi Waterhouse and Ellie Gould were brutally murdered, and we fully appreciate the horrific impact of such crimes on victims' families. We are committed to reviewing sentencing for domestic homicides. As part of this review, we are examining the consequences such changes to sentencing could have for victims of domestic abuse. I caught up with Carol after her and Julie's meeting with the Justice Secretary. He announced a review into domestic homicide sentencing, which would involve a QC looking at the data of more than 100 cases. I want to find out what happened. Hi, Carol. Thanks for talking to me again. What did Robert Buckland say about the sentencing laws? Um, one quite reassuring thing is that Julie and I will be key stakeholders in this review. How does it work? We will be involved in the reviews um, and our voices will very much reflect 
um, the voices of victims um, and for other families who, whose loved ones have been killed in the home. He admitted that the, the law is 25 years old and there is a need for reform. Wow. What do you hope will happen with the law around, you know, the murder weapon being at the scene? Um, I want it to be levelled up so it's treated exactly the same as um, a weapon taken to the scene. Hopefully the changes to the sentencing for domestic homicide will be in the victim's bill. Um, but sadly, the first draft of that won't be until spring 2023. That seems like such a long time. Why are they not pushing this through quickly to send out a strong message that, you know, violence against women and girls will not be tolerated? It does really sound like you've, you know, you've really got the ear of the government at the moment. We haven't got to the end of it. We haven't achieved what we set out to do. So until we get to that stage, I, I don't feel like we've achieved anything. I hope that you and Judy achieve everything that you hope. I am so inspired by how these two mums have reacted to such heartbreak where their daughters are brutally murdered by campaigning for changes that will help others. It may take some time for the system to respond, but I've got a feeling they're not going to stop until they achieve what they set out to do. And let's not forget the reason why because too many men simply can't cope with rejection and react with cruelty and viciousness. These aren't crimes of passion. These are crimes of possession. They gotta stop. And behind the statistics are the incredible, unique young women whose lives have been taken too soon, but will always be remembered. Like Ellie Gould, who started me on this investigation. She was just the most lovely, amazing person. She'd always be in our minds, I find that I miss her in the most ordinary of situations, like just having wine nights now with the girls and she's not there. She was always there to be able to talk to you if you needed to and cheer you up. Always kind of knew what to say. There's not a day that goes by that I do not think about her because it's the one way that I can see her. It's the one that I can think about her. She'll always hold a special place in my heart. She was a very kind, caring young lady, very thoughtful, but she was fun to be around. She had a great sense of humour. I had a big circle of friends. That's why she's such a devastating loss to us and the wider community. And that's why I have to do this for her.